Hello, thank you for tuning in. I'm Emily Mullins with Michigan Alliance for Families. Michigan Alliance for Families is a free parent training and information service. Our goal is to improve educational services and outcomes for students with disabilities. Our regional parent mentors live where they serve and know about local resources. You can connect your regional parent mentor with specific questions about your situation. Call 1-800-552-4821 or email info at michiganallianceforfamilies.org. We are here today to talk about sensory processing disorders. When parents and schools have a better understanding of how sensory processing can impact a student, those needs can be addressed. Let's welcome our presenter, Dr. Sally Burton-Hoyle. Okay. I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about sensory processing disorder. Um, our agenda for the for the our time here is, and these are the, the, the things that we want to cover. And that is, first of all, we live in a world with lots of sensation. Um, and there's sensation in, in smell and 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 the, the food we eat and and all around us. Okay, so let's start with that. Then we want to talk about some of the different sensory styles that that you may have, um, and then we'll get into talking about what a sensory processing disorder is. Um, we're going to break that down into sensory avoiding and sensory seeking sorts of things and its impact on behavior, and then we'll talk more about the sensory areas in the sensory diet that you may be interested in, um, in, in developing. Um, now, I wanna start off by saying I'm not an occupational therapist um, and an occupational therapist is who does assessments and work specifically with individuals with disabilities that may have sensory issues um, and sensory processing disorders. And there's a difference between having a sensory issue and having a disorder. So hopefully we'll, you know, you, you can think about that. Um, but let's start with looking at, at, a, at a case study. And um, Tony, Tony was funny and bright and he could draw and write and he was creative. Um, if there was any change in routine or there was a fire drill or something like that, he would scream and rock uncontrollably. He was impossible to calm down. And if anybody tried to touch him, he might strike out at them. When he had to go to the bathroom, he would take off all his clothes because he feared he may get just a, the tiniest bit of, of liquid on, on himself. Um, and, and people mistakenly believed that this is autism. And, and you know, in, in being tested, it was a sensory disorder. It was a sensory processing disorder. Um, and so there's sensory processing disorders, which people can have with or without a disability. Um, there are many, many people that have a sensory disorder that have no diagnosed um, educational label or anything like that. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, and it's best to kind of sort out what the sensory issue might be uh, before there is perhaps a, a disability involved. And your occupational therapist, again, um, is is the person that, that you would talk to either through your school or uh, looking, you know, looking online to identify somebody, talking to other parents. Um, so I started off by saying a, a sensation is everywhere, and, and it is. And if we think about uh, things we might be ticklish about or uh, with our clothes, we, we demand that they have tags or we have to cut the tags out right away or we even purchase um, things that, that don't have tags in them. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things that people do to regulate themselves. And one of those things might be exercise. And some people, in order to self-regulate and have a good day, they need to work out and they need to work out hard. Um, do you do you like lemonade? Uh, can you can you not tolerate different kinds of light? Um, do you have lot? Do you, do you want a lot of loud noise? Um, and, and everybody deals with sensation differently, 
And we all deal with sensation differently depend, depending on, on the environment uh, that we're in. So when we, we talk about those kinds of things, that's it's not a sensory disorder to be bothered by the tags um, in, in your clothes and things like that. Um, and, and I think all of us have sensory experiences. And my first sen sensory experience that I recall, and now I can look at it and say, oh my, was when I was pregnant and I became nauseated when I smelled hamburger frying. Um, and, and so there's there's things like that, or there might be certain textures that, that you like, um, that, you, that, that, you just, that you just can't tolerate. So let's talk about your sensory experiences and all of us have sensory experiences and remember a sensory experience is not the same as a um, sensory processing disorder. And my first sensory experience was when I, and I'd never been bothered by the smell of hamburger cooking, but all of a sudden when I was pregnant, I was very much bothered by that. And I think that any of us uh, who've experienced pregnancy, or our partners have experienced pregnancy. There have been different sorts of sensory things that 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 have been a kind of kind of been a new thing. Um, Carrie Dunn is a person that has studied how people deal with the environment. Carrie is an occupational therapist and written and presents lots on this. And she talks about the the sensation and and how do we you know there's different ways that we in, input the sensation and <clears throat> there's sensation seekers and that that's a person who wants their daily routine packed with sensation. They've got that planner going. Maybe they've got a couple of planners and they want every minute filled. They want to use, be productive with all moments of their day and night. Um, and then there's bystanders who are easygoing and loosely organized. And then there's avoiders. And these are people that if there's a change in their life, um, they're, they kind of throws them and the, their ability to manage things kind of, you know, kind of, kind of goes away. And then there are sensors and sensors are picky because their sensory needs are so specific. And if you look at those things, I think every one of us know somebody who has maybe one of these things quite strongly, or if you're like a lot of people, maybe you've got a little bit of this. Um, I think that, and there's an assessment that, that goes along with this. And when I've taken it, I've, I've been like a seeker because I do like my routine and I like to know what it is I'm going to be doing. Um, but I also um, don't don't maybe don't like some change. So maybe I'm a seeker and an avoider. Now, does this is this a is this a disorder? No, not necessarily. It's just kind of the way that how the environment impacts me. Um, nothing's a disorder until you can't function in your daily life. So that's what we're talking about. All of us, you know, we want the radio a different way. We want, you know, all kinds of things a different way. But until something interferes with uh, with the with whatever your occupation is, occupation meaning whatever it is you have to do. Uh, so whether it's being in school, or maybe it's it's working a job, or or maybe it's just in our social interactions. Are there things that interfere with that? Then then that's what we would we would be we would be talking about. Um, and first of all, you you should recognize that you have a way to self-regulate. And you know the, the thing is is that if we, we recognize these things and, and some of us are more stringent than others in dealing with them. Uh, for instance, I build my routine around my workouts and I make sure that that I don't have meetings and other th sorts of things scheduled that interfere with this. Okay, um, so that's that's how I deal with it. I kind of I kind of manage these these sorts of things. Um, now, if you can't manage these sorts of things, then you might have something called sensory overload, and that's when you can't regulate how you deal with sensation in the environment. And then that's when the challenging behavior occurs. So I think we can all guess 
um, you know, the scenario with this little guy. Um, he may be, let's say that he didn't get a nap and he was, he was too tired and then he wanted to do something and he was told no. Or maybe he wanted um, a third cookie after dinner and, and he just couldn't handle it. So it might have been something simple. Maybe his mom asked him to come to the dinner table. So it, it depends on can you regulate how you deal with sensation, and if you can't, then that's where that that begins to to be a problem. So if we talk about sensory processing disorder, it affects the way a person responds to information that comes in through the senses. So let's say you walk in a walk in a room, and there's um, there's there's food out. Does does the smell of the food bother you? Um, does it bother you that a lot of people are talking at once? Um, or does it not bother you at all? A person with SPD, sensory processing disorder, may be oversensitive or unresponsive. So it's kind of like it, it can go one way or the other, or sometimes it can go both um, to sound, touch, taste, sight, and or smell. It can range in severity and in more extreme cases can make it difficult to get through everyday tasks. And see when it interferes with everyday tasks is when, um, is when the disorder part of it comes into play. Um, and I don't know whether you knew this, one in 20 children are affected by the symptoms of sensory processing disorder. And it's important to learn about this as a topic because let's say that um, you've got you've got a, a, a student in school and they have gotten an assignment and it's been returned to them and they need to do it over and then then they lose it. OK, so do we want to call that a disorder or do we want to look instead at kind of the totality, like how does this person take in the environment? And maybe maybe it was just like one small thing and he, and, he, and he really got upset about it. And remember when things go beyond what you can manage and there's sensory overload, if it interferes with your life, then that's, that's a disorder. Okay, some of the signs of, of the SPD, and remember one, one of these things doesn't matter, right? Because any one of us can have these sorts of things. Um, you know, your clothes might feel too scratchy or itchy or uh, things seem too bright or things seem too loud or soft touches are, you know, like we don't want anybody touching us. Um, it, you know, food makes us gag um, in certain environments, uh, you know, getting your getting your ability to kind of keep yourself right as, as you're walking. Um, let's, let's say it's very busy, uh, walking down a hallway or something, and, and maybe you get clumsy then. Um, you're afraid to play on the swings because that's, uh, that's frightening to you. And then if there's an extreme reaction for no apparent reason, and I say for no apparent reason because that's, you know, in, in my work, uh, going and, and consulting in schools in various places, um, a, a person might walk into an environment and then have a meltdown. And, and then people immediately think, oh, it's for no apparent reason. This person's unpredictable. When really every single one of these things might be at play. Maybe they've got scratchy clothes. Uh, the routine has been upset. Uh, they, they weren't able to eat the food. Um, and then there were other things that they were that they were afraid of that they had to that they had to handle. So one of these things doesn't matter, right? One of these things isn't going to interfere with your daily life. And that's kind of the message I'm going to send home. If it's nothing that's interfering with your daily life, then it's just it's just a thing that you learn how to how to deal with. Um, there, there's signs, some of the signs of sensory processing disorder in adults might be the way people wear clothes. Um, and maybe there, I know we all know some people that they just have to wear caftans or very, very, you know, very oversized sorts of clothes. Or there are some people that cannot 
tolerate thunderstorms. Um, or there are people that that like the swimming pool, but they don't like the lake. Those are those are all, you know, a, again, one of these things is not a disorder, having all these things that interfere with your life. Um, and, and, and maybe you can't stand big bear hugs or maybe having pictures taken if there's a bright flash is, is upsetting um, to you. And uh, certain things just taste wrong. And no matter how much people try to tell you that you will like something that's a soft texture, you know for a fact that you're not. So sensory processing disorder can impact your behavior. Okay, if you have this as a disorder and a number of different things going on, um, then it, it makes it difficult to interact in your daily environment. So if you are bothered by all the things in the environment, the, the sounds and the smells and, and, and anticipating maybe somebody might bump into you, this is going to impact how you how you interact with people. So let's say you're walking down a busy school hallway. And, and all these things are just like overpowering. And, and one person described it to me as an assault on their senses. And, and then, then somebody says hi to you. Well, probably that is not going to be an easy time to, uh, to, to have a conversation with people. And so this is interfering with the, with the person's ability to interact with others. Um, and also think about all the different activities, especially with, with school children that they're expected to engage in with groups. So groups mean other people, mean other many different conversations going on, and uh, then the sights and sounds of the environment. Um, and, and one of the things that a person uh, who experiences uh, sensory disorders told me, he said, it's like, it's like the, the volume on, on the world is, is turned up way high. And then that kind of includes other things um, besides just, um, you know, besides just like, it, it's never just one thing. It's impacting everything, um, sights and sounds and smells, all sorts of things. So it disrupts how the brain uh, takes in, organizes and uses the messages that we receive through our body receptors. So let's say that you're bothered by uh, the perfume counter um, at, at malls. Uh, or at a, at, a, at a store or something like that. Um, what you do is, if, without a sensory processing disorder, you might know it bothers you. So guess what you do? You, you take in that message and then you change what it is you're going to do. You either walk out of the store and walk around or you walk through a different part of the store so that you're not having to do that. So if you're unable to, to organize your, your body uh, to get through that, then you, then you might be one of those people that has, has a meltdown um, at different sorts of smells. Um, and when I say smells, I don't mean bad smells. I mean any kind of smell. Uh, there are many um, buildings on my campus that are um, scent-free buildings so that people can't, um, you know, are encouraged. I don't think there's any policemen at the door, but they're encouraged to not have any sort of scent. And scent is not just perfume. Scent might be in deodorant or shampoo or uh, being around a person that's smoking cigarettes cigarettes or, you know, any kind of smoke, uh, vaping or something like that. Um, so usually what we do, we take in this information of whatever's going on, and then we make according, you know, we make changes. We, we accommodate ourselves and so that we can kind of get through it. But what if you're unable to do that? If you're unable to do that, then that can be a problem. So the primary sensory areas that we're talking about you know, today are all the things that that you've you've learned from when you were little, and that is the things that you see. Um, and you know, it, there are some individuals that can not look at directly at people, for instance, because that's something that's that's confusing to them, or they can't look at somebody's face. That's confusing to them. So the things taken in through the eyes. 
then then we've also then got the there's the ear for how things sound and and how things sound for a, to a person that has a sensory disorder might be very different keep in mind think of like that big volume control because that that's kind of what what helps me um what helps me kind of figure out what it is that might be bothering people um, and so, uh, you know, th things that, um, that might touch your lips, uh, things that you might have to touch. And, and we think about children in school, their, their senses are assaulted on a daily basis, because if we look at the lunchroom, if we look at um, different sorts of activities, let's say in kindergarten, that they're expected to play with shaming foam. What if that's not tolerate it right or um or, or the different again the, the smells and things so um there's there's something else too that we'll talk about kind of later on and that is then proprioceptive and then there's vestibular and your vestibular is kind of a you know they've been researching these sort of vestibular and proprioceptive over the past 40 years or so but that's your balance um and in motor skills and if you get bombarded with other things it may impact how it is you can you can keep your balance um and then also how do things feel on your on on your joints um on your you know uh, you know if if everybody's running um is that something that because of your proprioceptive issues makes that difficult okay so sensory processing disorder and these these on this slide here is the the two ways i want you to kind of begin to break things down and that is that people, not just kids, any of us, may be oversensitive to sensory input, or they may be undersensitive, or both. Okay, because it's you know it would be it would be easy if we could just say, oh, it's just this one thing. So let me define the terms, and these are important because these are terms that you might hear at a meeting or you know in your child's meeting or, or wherever. If a person's hypersensitive, that's when they get too much of the world. They experience too much. So things seem too loud. Things seem too bright. The smells are too pungent. It's, it's you know, it's just too much. And then sometimes the behavior we see with a person who's hypersensitive might be to escape or withdraw. Uh, and, and they like the sights and sounds, so then they get under their desk or they um, find a hidey hole um, that, that people find them in. So hypersensitive is sensory avoiding. So it's like they, there's like too much of things. So when you're hypersensitive, there's too much. If you're hyposensitive, there isn't enough. Okay, there isn't enough sensory, um, sensory experience for you. Um, and so instead of when you know when we're walking down the hall that isn't enough for you and so maybe then the, the person might be stomping or the person might be climbing up on something and jumping down because they need more sensory experiences so instead of standing in line in school and getting ready to go to recess or lunch or whatever um that is the person that's like kind of kind of ramming into the walls or uh laying down on the ground um they're seeking more so when hypersensitive they got too much of things hyposensitive is that they they they're craving it they're they're wanting they're wanting to have this then sometimes um then there there can be where you're just kind of all mixed up right where where you can't tell what's what and and i i venture to say that when a, when a child has a meltdown which there's a difference i'm going to point out too between a tantrum and a meltdown a tantrum is something that the kid is um let's say you say no more cookies and 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 then they get mad because they want more cookies there's going to be an end to that because then they're going to realize they don't get cookies um if the person melts down that's kind of out of their control and it's usually because that's a cumulative effect and that is there's been too much of the world and and so how they have to deal with that 
is, uh, is, is what they have a sensory meltdown. So, and they're not tantrums and it's important. And I, I, I feel like if somebody has a seizure, then that, you know, I, I kind of think of that sometimes as a sensory meltdown. Sometimes there's been too much. Sometimes people experience seizures when their stress is very high, when there's a lot of other things going on. Um, so when things are out of their control, they have a meltdown. And so it's important that we recognize this with kids because sometimes we punish kids for being kids. And, and <clears throat> instead of looking at the fact that they're really, they've had too much of things. And my, my background is, is all autism. And so uh, many, many, many people um, have sensory sorts of issues. Some have autism, some don't, right? Now, I don't know a person with autism that doesn't have some kind of sensory issues, but Temple Grandin, who's a very famous person in the world of autism, um, <clears throat> I know her mother very well. And what she recognized was that when Temple was little, if Temple was, when Temple was little, if she kept her out too long, if they stayed at the shopping mall too long, and then Temple had a meltdown, she did not punish her because she recognized that was kind of her fault and it was out of her control. So I always think that's kind of a good thing to, as a parent, to think about what, what, are we, what are we putting the kids through? And is it a tantrum or is it, is it a, a meltdown? Um, so some signs and symptoms of that uh, sensory processing disorder when they're seeking, remember, because we've got seeking kinds of things, hyposensitive, they're seeking, they're undersensitive, and they have a need for contact, pressure, movement, climbing, uh, different kinds of smells. And, and, and again, it crosses all the different sorts of sensory things of, of taste and touch and, and smell. Um, so they might be touching things lots and they might be smelling things lots. They might be very rough with different things. Um, they might have a very high tolerance for pain. I have seen individuals that have a broken ankle that are highly hyposensitive that are walking around on it because it's it maybe it doesn't it doesn't feel like the kind of pain it would to um, to the rest of us or to a person that's hypersensitive. And perhaps, you know, we'll, we'll talk about hypersensitive, but think in the contrary, that a kid that we, we can't comb their hair because that's too much for them. So um, a, a person that's hyposensitive, lots of movement, um, invading lots of people's personal space for lots of different reasons, just Dis distracted, anxious, lots going on. And a perfect example. Of, of where we see this might be a, a, a shopping, the shopping experience um, and a crowded store is an overwhelming experience for kids with sensory processing issues because we've got the lights we and, and for people that are sensitive to certain kinds of lighting that might cause different kinds of behaviors. Uh, for kids who just like being touched um, and, and they're, they're so um, anticipating that somebody might touch them that 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 causes them to have meltdowns. So it's like it's it's like everything. So you know, kind of like the shopping mall and food courts and cafeterias and places like that are sometimes um, kind of a, a place that that people might want to avoid just because it uh, you know kind of gets at all the different issues that a person might be dealing with sensory wise. Okay, so then proprioceptive, I talked about that earlier. So uh, proprioceptive disorder is, you know, when, when people are clumsy and uncoordinated and sensory seeking, they are often experiencing proprioceptive dysfunction. And this is some of the things they might do in their writing. Maybe they're the ones that are breaking their pencils, that they're, that they're playing rough, that they're always moving their feet or banging their feet against the walls. Um, maybe they, they're, they're chewing 
different sorts of things like chewing on their shirt or on their hair. And, and these are also individuals, this, an example of something that someone might do too, is to put on lots and lots of clothes. Um, and, you know, so they've got their, their, their hooded sweatshirt on and maybe they want their coat on. Um, so, and, and this is, you know, in just to, hopefully you're, you're thinking about somebody you might know and how this could be, uh, this could be some of the things that they'd been doing, but unfortunately they might have been blaming the kid, um, the, 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 child, the child for this, instead of looking at what is the impact of the environment on them? So let's, Jessica, poor Jessica, and worked with Jessica's parents and everything was a problem. Everything involved, you know, chasing her around the house to, to get her in the car to, uh, if they were going to take her to get a haircut, because none of them in the family trusted them to cut her hair when she wanted to move around so much. Uh, fingernail and toenail cutting uh, it was just something that seems impossible to people. I, I know families that they wait till the child is kind of asleep and then they try to attempt uh, some of these sorts of things. Um, so wearing socks and 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 dressing in general, they just that these things are very bothered. Uh, they're very very bothered by that, and and I think. If you could look at this, this is a combination of things that they're seeking in their of and they're avoiding. Um, so it isn't ever just one thing. So Jessica loves smelling perfumes, carpets, and bathroom smells. And the bathroom smells she happened to like were Lysol. Um, so, but there can be other people who who crave pungent odors. And so they might some like, you know, they might like some of the other things, the smells around the urinal or the toilet or something, because they are they're they're craving some of those um, big, big smells. And then, but then there could also be loud and unexpected sounds or, or touch is also then very um, terrible uh, for, for poor Jessica. So, you know, when, when people come to me with that kind of problem and say, we want, you know, we want a, a behavior approach to this, really what the occupational therapist would do is that they would they would look to see kind of the source of some of the different issues um, and then based on that then perhaps give them the diagnosis of a sensory processing disorder um, which is very different than punishment or if you you know if you don't come back here for so I can comb your hair you're not gonna get to go to the movies with us or something like that so I think it's really, really important that if you have somebody in your life with lots of sensory issues, think about the impact of the environment um, on them. And, and is are things too much? Um, or are they are they are they craving? And, and I think you just need to think about what it is they're doing. When I think about students that um, are put into gen ed music class. And instead, they're in the corner, hands over their head, you know, rocking, um, you know, th that's, that's too much for them. Are they being non-compliant? No, they're not being non-compliant. They're probably being, it's probably a punishing sensory environment for them. Um, we're, we're the person that is craving lots of different kinds of smells. And sometimes it's it's hard, and which is why we need an OT to do this, like what is, um, you know, what what's the behavior based on? Students that do a lot of humming and making a lot of loud, loud sounds might seem like they're craving the sound, but sometimes, guess what? They're doing it to hide um, or to, um, because they, they want to get rid of the other smell, uh, the other sounds. So if I can scream louder than you, then I don't have to hear you. And, and this is the part that always creates confusion and, and how, you know, what are we going to do with these people? That is why you need like that, that whole sensory approach and the whole idea of thinking about, uh, you know, so it's like universal, we can say un sensation is universal, right? We all experience sensation. But when we're talking about sensory sorts of things, we need to think about 
the area that it impacts. So we we let's and we'll go through and talk about each of these things. But auditory, of course, is how you take in sound, and are you able to take in sound and uh, translate that into words and sentences and things like that? Visual, obvious. That's that's what it is you see. Um, then your tactile is what you're touching. And then proprioceptive, then proprioceptive and vestibular is then how your body is dealing with these different environments uh, as with balance and with uh, kind of where are you in the environment and, and is that confusing and how much do you need uh, to, to kind of regulate in, in this environment. Um, an often ignored sensory area is olfactory, which is which is what you smell. And uh, I've seen when when students have language, sometimes they get in trouble for saying things that are deemed uh, disrespectful. Uh, I was around a young man in a classroom, and the teacher wanted him to sit more, you know, right by him so he could help him with his assignment. And and the young man said, I won't sit by you. You stink. You stink like cheese. And of course, then that was turned into that poor student was being disrespectful and he was asked to leave the classroom, as opposed to this man had a pungent odor on him that even I could tell. But we can't use ourselves as the basis because we may not pick up on all the different things, unless you too have been diagnosed with a sensory processing disorder in whatever that that student is displaying, um, you know, I, I think you you need to you, you need the help of the experts, um, and or at least to think about is is that person really not moving by that person because they're bothered by the smell? Um, it could be lots of lots of reasons why. Uh, it, it's important when students have parapros that parapros understand uh, sensory sorts of things so that they don't, if there are boundaries uh, physically around the individual, that they're able to um, that they're able to do without those. Okay, so we'll, let's talk about auditory processing disorder. Um, and that's a hearing problem that impacts like 5% of school age children. And, and what that means is that they, they hear, they hear, like so when you do a hearing test, they can hear everything fine, but it's what, how the processing, like when they take in the sounds, does the brain know what to do with it? Um, so are they able to immediately translate a teacher uh, giving a direction immediately uh, and a teacher gives a direction everybody stand up and put your boots on does the student is he able to process that and do that immediately um, if they don't um, usually again then that's where the non-compliance they say it's non-compliance so auditory processing is something that there is lots of testing for speech and language pathologists do testing in that area as well and but the reason for this is that the ears and the brain aren't fully coordinating, uh, so that the messages are not getting, not getting um, to you know to the right place. Um, my one of the reasons why I got really interested in the whole idea of sensory processing is that I my my youngest son, who's a grown man now and very successful he's a high school teacher and coach and all that sort of thing, but when he was young he had all kinds of sensory issues. And what that looked like to his teachers and to the principal looked like he perhaps maybe had an emotional impairment or so non-compliant that, you know, there was behavior disorders, all kinds of things. And, but I never forget one time, he was probably five years old and I was looking right at him and I was talking to him and I was thinking I was getting mad at him about something. And he was, staring intently at me and he said I don't know what you're saying I'm like, and he was listening to me but he could not process it and then luckily I was in a school district where they were pretty knowledgeable about um about sensory issues and he got tested for that um he also had a learning disability which I don't think you know I think those are things that might go hand in hand maybe not um you can have sensory processing disorder 
all on its own. You can have a sensory processing disorder and any other sort of uh, disability. Um, but that, that was something that when he got diagnosed with auditory processing disorder, I remember going like, oh, okay, all right, I get it, I get it. So some of the things, then there's auditory processing. Remember, that's kind of the universal um, term. Then there's auditory hypersensitivity. And that's, again, remember, they're getting too much, too much, too much. Um, that can cause depression if over the long term, there's just way too much sound. Can you see where you might want to begin avoiding places? Um, and when you're avoiding things, that could lead to depression and anxiety. Um, some people experience ear pain. Um, if you're not wanting to talk and listen and interact, that can lead to relationship problems, can't it? Uh, which is why, again, this is a this is a lifespan sort of uh, sort of situation unless a person learns how to regulate um, themselves. So, uh, you know, trouble connecting with others might lead, and if you can't, then the social isolation. Um, some sounds that might seem very like very loud. Um, and, and maybe other people aren't bothered by them at all. Maybe it's a running faucet. Uh, maybe it's the kitchen appliance. Maybe it's it's a car engine. Maybe it's a loud conversation. It's all relative. And if we think about somebody that has a disorder in the sensory area, it's something that's interfering with them. Um, I worked with a, a, a little boy that was, they were trying to uh, assess him for um for special education, especially in the area of emotional impairment, because he would slap students if they perhaps uh, made a sound with their mouth. And I remember one particular time in the lunchroom, somebody was eating fruit roll-ups and they were making particular sounds with them and he, and he slapped them. And so people automatically assumed that was because he was violent and antisocial and all these sorts of things when really he had a, a significant uh, sensory processing disorder. So I think it's something that we really have to think about. Then the hyposensitivity. Remember, they don't get enough. And so there's maybe maybe as a as a tiny baby, they're not making any sounds, but then they perhaps then the babbling and all that kind of comes in and then maybe there's an uh, excess of it. Uh, maybe they're very loud or they've got to have the TV very loud um, or they have difficulty with verbal cues um, when their name's called. Um, you know, perhaps they, they need it said much louder than other people. Um, difficulty understanding or remembering what was said, because when they're having to make that effort um, to, you know, and maybe they're wanting things to be louder and, and kind of create, you know, meet that need, uh, they're not getting it. Maybe they say what lots, okay? So they need re instructions repeated um, over and over again. And maybe they talk out loud to themselves and they talk themselves through tasks, which I think as an adult, I do that lots. And I have the, um, the convenience of having an office that I'm by myself. So I can talk to myself or I'm in the car and I can remind myself about things. So like if we look at age wise, I think all of us do that a little bit more. But if you're in the fourth grade or you're in school and you're talking yourself through things, people don't understand that. Um, and then they might be oblivious to certain sounds. And then sometimes not understanding where the sound is coming from. And I think that that it, that's that's very confusing because and I think ultimately this could be a health and safety um, danger if you can't tell where uh, where a car is coming from when you're walking on the street. So it, it's something that that's pretty important. So what we want to do is we want to get a balance for things because there's very rarely is it just the hypersensitivity or the hyposensitivity. It's usually kind of a, a mixed uh, a, a mixed ball of, of all those kinds of things. Um, and, and what's recommended is um, natural uh, sounds, you know, being outside, um, 
uh, you know, playing listening games where there has to be pretty good instructional control for the teachers so that everybody is kind of is not talking. So there aren't a lot of conversations going on, but learning how to listen to different kinds of sounds and identify what they are um, and or calming and, and focusing music uh, that that works sometimes everything is is worth a, a shot. Um, some of these things are very, very inexpensive to try, aren't they? You know, how much is it going to be to go outside if you've got somebody that that you're wondering about? Of course, you know, has to be weather has to be right and stuff, things like that. So then a visual sensory processing disorder. Okay. So it's a it's a visual processing or perceptual disorder. And it, it refers to that inability to make sense of the information taken in through the eyes. Um, and there's a there's, this is different from not being able to see. Uh, this is where they're seeing it, and and perhaps it um, it it gets um, kind of confusing in how it is they're seeing it and how they're interpreting what it is. And this impacts how visual information is is interpreted. And especially if if it's a picture or something shown in school or class or with the lesson, and maybe not enough time is given for it, it's something that could be uh, could be very confusing and and cause a student not to do well. Um, and I'm just going to throw in some different ideas that uh, this is something. It's a it's a textured wall, and and it's lots of times there are different schools that I've been in that have had sensory um, areas or sensory act um, things in the hallway. And, and um, in a school I was in, they had this, this, this picture here, this only it was a real sculptor. I don't know what you call it a statue, it isn't a statue, but um, it's things that kids can come up and look at. Uh, so if you are bothered by that, probably we would use this. But if somebody needed lots and lots of different information um, and they they liked being bombarded by lots of different things, then perhaps this is something that the student could take a break um, in class and um, and go out and maybe maybe they've got some tactile sorts of needs as well. Uh, so I, I think it's kind of cool. And it's something that any of the activities that I'm going to be showing or talking about are going to be things that create, you know, that kind of go for that balance of, of things. Um, and then we'll, let's talk about eating at restaurants and, and that's an acoustic assault uh, for people with sensory processing issues. And, and if we have the kind of um, issues where kids are you know, running away from the table um, or trying to leave the, the restaurant or uh, throwing their food or spitting out their food or different sorts of things like that. And, you know, we kind of expect that when kids are tiny, but as kids get older, if they're still doing it, people aren't quite so kind, are they? Um, and this then if, if you begin being impacted by going out in public, this is going to have um, a, a major uh, impact on, on the individual and their family. So it's really good to take these things seriously and get some help for them if it's a consistent across the board problem. Uh, if somebody is nine years old and they are still like spitting food out and throwing it and they're not eating more than one or two different things, this is something. And and if you have a child that uh, this becomes a real eating issue, which is not uncommon, uh, there are uh, what called feeding teams at various um, pediatric units at hospitals. And usually these feeding teams are, um, you know, a speech and language therapist and a psychologist and an occupational therapist and a psychologist. And they work as a team to try to figure out kind of what the what a particular kind of um, eating issue is. But usually sensory is like is, is a piece of that. Then there's the hypersensitivity visually. Dan, I think that lots of times we're used to people not being able to be around fluorescent lights. Um, and, and this can be where like, oh, kind of like annoying or you notice it. 
So think of the think of the spectrum from oh yeah that is fluorescent lighting to it's that the person can't tolerate it even to the point of having physical symptoms. Um, uh, visual hypersensitivity can be also from forcing somebody to to look at something as well. I've I've seen that with um, some individuals with autism that everybody's telling them to look that they have to look directly at the person and and sometimes they can't do that and I, I you know I'm beyond getting my feelings hurt by things but somebody um, I was talking with them and they kept trying to look at me um, to answer me and then they finally said I can't I can't look at you you make my stomach sick and I'm like oh, okay all right thank you very much for that but it, it is the idea that that hypersensitivity is not just an object or something. It, it can it could be from people, sunlight, glare, uh, visual overcrowding, uh, too many things to look at in the environment can be overwhelming. I feel that way sometimes when I walk in restaurants where you have to order up at the front and then there's like a big giant menu and you have to pick. Um, that's like, oh, my gosh, I hate to do that now. And you know what, though? because I don't have a disorder in it, guess what? I will just go to a different restaurant. I'll go to a restaurant where I get a menu that has pictures and I can say, what is this item called? And then I can get that. Okay, so too much movement in a playground can make it uncomfortable for a child to play happily. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but if you look at typical elementary school playgrounds, there's like a lot going on, you know, there's like different, you know, groups of kids, but then there's also games and uh, kids playing on different equipment and things like that. And it might look like so much that when we say, oh, find something to play with or to, you know, people to play with or an equipment to go play on or get in, you know, go in the swing or something like that, it might be too much. And then the student doesn't want to be out there. So let's just think about socially what that does. Um, so it's, a, it's overwhelming them sensory wise, but also then people misinterpret that to that the kid's antisocial. The kid may not be antisocial at all. It just might be that they are hypersensitive to seeing lots of different things. So then there's the hyposensitivity and people might try to um, take in so much environment visually and, and pictures and people and things like that that they they are seeing double that they that it might look like their their eyes are crossed because they're trying so hard to bring it all in um and then you know sometimes there's too there's lots of fatigue uh from from having you know trying to try so hard to bring in things and then the like putting objects in your mouth and Something that people do like is um, is brushing their teeth um, when they have uh, visual hyposensitivity because there's something about the sensation of the, the vibration on the teeth that somehow does something for people visually. And quite understanding of that, but let's, how is that gonna hurt, right? Um, Tactile disorders, tactile or touch sensitivity. Um, it's just they don't want to. They don't want to touch things. They don't want to touch their pen. They don't want to touch the art materials. They don't want to touch their food. Let's take that to when a child is very young, holding their hand. They may, you know, and sometimes it's called tactile defensiveness, right, where they can't stand their hand being held, um, and, and it's it's real. It's a real thing, and that's what I hope that if it is you're watching this, you're you're getting the you're getting the idea that it isn't a behavior problem. In fact, it could potentially be be a sensory thing. Uh, tactile hypersensitivity again, more of uh, difficulty with teeth brushing with this because holding on, you know, holding on to something, brushing your hair, uh, brushing your teeth, uh, wearing shoes, wearing socks, uh, messy uh, finger paint, and different kinds of uh, activities like that. Um, and then the hyposensitivity, they're craving touch. They're needing to touch everything and everyone. This can also then look like self-abusive behavior because if they're craving and they're pinching themselves or they 
had a little scab um, that they're scratching away at and to the point of where they're scratching away skin, high tolerance, uh, putting objects in, in your mouth. Uh, you know, they're not aware of different kinds of things like bumping into things and, and maybe they have a lot of bruises and things like that. Uh, bruises, cuts, harmful acts might not register as easily and may not be aware when their face is dirty. And, and perhaps then we combine that with some other sensory issues. They might, when they're eating, have food all over their face and not, and not realize it. Um, and so then there's different tactile activities. Um, and that is, and, and, you know, have some chew gum, uh, get different items from your kitchen, uh, lemon, um, different sorts of, of things that that they can that they can touch and they can they can smell uh, give strong tasting foods um i know someone that um that that began a love for cooking when they begin working on things like that. And she loves to cook and she loves to put lots of different things that create different sensation. And she likes uh, to eat a sandwich that has like perhaps peanut butter and sardines in it. And as crazy as that sounds, she loves the way that sounds. Um, she likes the crunch of that, of that because so it's like tactile activities can, again, it isn't just tactile. It, these things can are balancing uh, the individual with all of the different things that they might want. Okay, so we talked about proprioceptive. So we got the, the five sensations or the, our, our, you know, our eyes, our nose, our, our, our mouth, our ears, our touching with our hands. The proprioceptive is the sensation that people get um, when they are when they are lifting and they're pulling uh, heavy objects and um, and and those are things that again if we see an excess in behavior of somebody doing these things we might call it a behavior problem when in fact that person perhaps could be craving uh, more sensation in their joints and, and connective tissues um, and stimulating the proprioceptive by engaging activities that push uh, push things together, okay? Hanging from monkey bars. Um, so there's different playground activities. There's different in the real, uh, in real adulthood, there's lots of opportunity for this, isn't there? When you're cleaning or you're uh, moving things around in the garage or uh, you happen to have a job where you need to, to, to lift and, and do different kinds of things that if a person school age has proprioceptive issues, sometimes it really helps them to get a job in the school that, and perhaps it's done just once a week and maybe it's where they, um, they, they lift the boxes um, and put them out on a table uh, for the secretary to, you know, to disseminate things. So there's lots of, you, you gotta really use your head. You gotta kind of look around. Um, what I don't wanna see is, and I've seen this done in schools, and that is when people have a grocery cart um, in the, um, you know, out in the hallway, and it's filled with rocks and, and phone, old, old phone books and books and things like that. And then the person for their proprioceptive activities is pushing that back and forth. No, I don't like that at all, because it's not functional. There's no reason for it. And if people see them uh, doing that, it kind of makes them wonder about it, you know. So it's like, let's get some real jobs and some real things that need to be done. I think that, you know, if let's think about like uh, vacuuming and sweeping. I mean, there's lots of different things that might in, involve the like the, the pulling and things like that. Um, and then some of the things that are done for kids that have the proprioceptive issues is there's and I think you've seen that where you wrap a kid up in a like a like a burrito, roll them up in a blanket, and and it you know this has to be something that this is not a punishment. This is something that makes a, a student feel calmer. Okay, uh, push and pull with little kids pushing their own stroller. Um, 
backpacks are great ways for people to have functional uh, proprioceptive, um, you know, that, that it's filled with toys and things like that. Um, and then the mini tramp, little mini trampolines that are uh, that are in classrooms and, and in homes everywhere. Uh, that's something that can yeah, that can create that sensation that that person is is needing as well. Um, pushing, pulling, carrying, raking leaves, um, uh, moving the, the the wheelbarrow, do push-ups against the wall, um, and those are. Those are things where you just are like, it's called a wall push-up, where you just go up against the wall like you would be doing a, a push-up if you were laying down when you do it against the wall. Um, and then reassuring pressure. So then there's a firm massage. Sometimes weighted vests um, and blankets are used. We have to be very careful in how we do those um, and what the weight is on them uh, because there is a formula. And it's like it says here, uh, please see raising a sensory smart child for weighted wearable recommendations. So you can't just, it isn't like, <clears throat> I bought a, a weighted blanket at Myers last year that was on sale. And it, I don't know what the weight is on it, but it's way too heavy. So I have it in one place and I've not, I've not moved it. <clears throat> vestibular ideas is that vestibular has to do with the sense of movement. Um, if a person has um, vestibular hypersensitivity, they might be very afraid of different kinds of movements. So they might not want to get on the swing set or they might not want to walk upstairs. They might not want to participate and learn how to ride a bike just because these are things that are impacting balance. Um, so when an occupational therapist, um, you know, is, is beginning to work on that, um, we, we've got, you know, and it, maybe it's spinning and swinging and hanging upside down. But I think if you work with an OT, you would learn kind of the proper amounts of time that should be done. So let's say that swinging calms someone down. Um, as, as, a, as a parent, you know that if you, with some, well, some children, they can spin for a few minutes and they're good to go, uh, or swinging might be good to go after a few moments. But if they're on too long, it can have the opposite effect and really dysregulate and, and upset the person. So again, we have to do this with a very watchful eye if we're just gonna try some of these things. And then olfactory is just that inability to process accurately the origin um, of different kinds of smells. Um, and I think we've seen lots of different activities that are kind of a combination of things. Um, and especially with smelling things, there, there can be opportunities with candies, with peppermint, uh, with cooking, with different kinds of soaps. Um, and if you like, uh, I was in a, a wonderful, wonderful resource room at the middle school level. And she had, that teacher had about four different kinds of hand soap that smelled like all different kinds of, 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 of scent to them. And the students would wash their hands and it would just like, it was great because it was a calming sort of thing. Um, and, and, and their, and also their hands were getting clean. So, um, and they were smelling, um, wonderful kinds of things. There's a new place in uh, downtown where I live that makes soap. And I loved and I went in there with my granddaughter and just like the smell of it is, is just, is just amazing, but it's good because I like it. If I had a sensory issue and somebody made me go into that soap store or made me go into Macy's at the mall by the perfume counter or Bed Bath & Beyond, someplace like that, I'm, I will impact my behavior. So we have to think really hard. And I hope you're thinking hard about if, if we're thinking about one of your children, like where are the places that you've been when that person um, has, has, you know, has a huge meltdown after that. So the taste input can help arouse a sluggish system. So there's lots of different ways that, um, that, that things can be used. Strong taste can stimulate the mouth for, of an undersensitive child and make him more willing to try new foods, uh, which is why I was talking about that 
the feeding team uh, before presenting new food, let the child have different kinds of things um, that that they might, um, you know, and that's the whole thing is like, uh, you know, getting getting somebody to at least put it up close enough that they could kind of maybe get a smell from it before they could even get a taste. Um, and again, tasting games, food preparation, playing with your food. A so-called picky eater may be more willing to eat uh, rocks and trees rather than meatballs and broccoli. But if you make some fun arrangements with vegetable um, and grape tomatoes and things like that, there's, you know, you, you just never know when you might entice this. So Okay, the last part of what I want to talk about today is what's called a sensory diet. Okay, so we know that there's sensation all around us, right? And then we all take in that sensation and deal with it in a different way, okay? Um, then there's sensory areas, okay? And that would mean a specific area that is bombarded by, um, you know, but, you know, that, that our site perhaps is bombarded by too much things to look at. So then, then we need to do something for that. Um, then we also know that it's, it's not a problem unless it's impacting your behavior. And then that's a sensory processing disorder. Okay. So then you get all this information and you see what the sensory areas are. And then you think, what could I put together in the way of a schedule that would help somebody stay focused and organized throughout the day, okay? So a sensory diet isn't food, it's a personalized activity plan, okay? Um, and they're simple and easy to do, and you can do them on a very simple basis um, and uh, if, with very complex things. Of course, again, you have you know, you're going to want to involve your occupational therapist. Um, and all of us do different kinds of things. And I'm, I'm, I love to, like when I'm sitting and I'm in a meeting or whatever, to keep myself awake, I always like shake my foot. And people, sometimes I'll catch them looking at me and, and I'll think, oh, I guess that, that looks weird, but that's kind of how I stay awake. So what are those things that, that, that are, that work? Um, so, all right. So the, and that sensory diet combined with professional intervention are usually immediate and, and cumulative. Um, and just to kind of go back to, um, to my son, uh, when he was, and he was got this diagnosis of a sensory issue and a learning disability in second grade, we started immediately with the school OT um, and then we had went to a private OT once a week and she worked on all his various kinds of proprioceptive and uh, issues and uh, all kinds of things. And within about six weeks, his behavior had calmed down at school to the point where the teachers and the principal cornered me when I went in to pick him up and said, do you have him on medication now? Because they really saw a huge difference. Okay. And, and, and that all things being, you know, relative, uh, they were able to ask him questions and see his response to different kinds of things. So sometimes that's going to be easier. Sometimes you don't need any words to figure out uh, what that person's response is going to be. Um, and things can still be immediate and cumulative um, with somebody who's nonverbal, right? It depends on how complex. Uh, but getting that combination of activities that that perk the person up when they need to be perked up or calm down when they need to be calmed down. Let's think about problem times in a school day. Kids coming in from recess. Lots of times there are some students that it's just right and they come in settled and ready to work. And there are some that no, they're not. And then they're going to need some activities to calm them down. So it's going to help them tolerate sensations and situations that are challenging. And more importantly, I think regulating emotions, alertness, and increase attention span, um, reduce unwanted sensory seeking and sensory avoiding behaviors, and handling transitions with less stress. So the idea that people are not aware of these things, and somebody might be um, having a you know a response 
in a negative way to different sensory things in their environment. And let's say they're, they're getting upset and things aren't going well and they're ready to have a meltdown or they're having a meltdown. Then the idea that we say, all right, get up, let's get in line, let's go to lunch. That's asking for trouble now, isn't it? So we have to, if, you know, if, if your child is having any kinds of issues, it's really worth it to think about what this is. Um, and then like lifelong, um, the sorts of, of sensory activities can just become a part of the person's life. I know with, with my son, he needed, he needed that, that pounding, like he needed to run and, and to run hard. And then as he got into middle school and high school, uh, lifting weights uh, was something, playing football. He played football, he played basketball, he did wrestling. He did that all through high school to the point where he was through natural ways regulating himself and, and that's kind of how he continues to do it. Um, and I think I bet I would have gotten that um, that, that sensory processing disorder uh, label as, as a child because I needed to move. And, and lots of times we think, oh, they're hyperactive when perhaps they just need the right kinds of activities to do this with. So, okay. So Jack was angry all the time. And once he began working with the OT and his sensory diet, he became a changed kid. And I've seen this kind of thing happen lots. Um, and yeah, do people think they're on medication? Um, and, and that that mom experienced the joy of a sensory, uh, you know, just like, oh my gosh, this this stuff really works. Some of the things that Jack was asked to do during the school day, um, and the whole idea of any any kind of thing somebody does in school is we want them to not be pulled away from the from education and learning. Um, we want them to be pulled away as tiny as possible, as little as possible. So some of the things that might work are, you can see the guy doing the wall push-ups. You can see the guy doing the chair push-ups. These are things that can be done. You don't have to leave the classroom for that. Um, depending on the age and size of that person, um, you know, they might get on that, uh, that the twirly thing there. Um, and then many, many schools have sensory rooms where there are there are swings set up like this, with, like where the person lays on their stomach um, and, and perhaps does their reading, does their spelling. Um, there's very, very innovative um, people around in Michigan. I've seen lots of different nice things going on. Um, and running around the block. And that's one of the things that with my son, if he was kind of starting to get um, kind of agitated and, and pretty salty, um, I would say, why don't you run around the block? And he would he would do that. That was like starting when he was like second or third grade. Um, and then, as I said, he went on to play college football. So um, it's something that that really did, did kind of work. Now, when we have... Um, you know, so like, let's say we might come up with some activities based on the sensory area uh, that that we're seeing. It's hypo, hyper. What is it? It's it's both. Then we have to think about well, how are they going to know what to do? And that's where having some sort of visual schedule would be used. Um, and so these are just examples of of uh, pictures. Um, they, these are the, all the kinds of schedules too you can purchase at, you can purchase at Best Buy. If you go on Amazon to find um, uh, child schedules or, um, you know, picture schedules, you can find so many different things. Um, if you like having things on your iPad, there can be those, you know, you can use your iPad. So you can have a digital kinds of sensory diet list. Okay. Uh, so there's lots of different ways. I've seen them in schools. Um, where kids know kind of what to do. Now, how much do you do something? Well, it depends, okay? If you, it has to be reasonable, right? Um, and so like with my son, I think he did things probably like he did five or six different kinds of activities throughout the day, and they were little things. They were the, the wall push-ups, um, the chair push-ups. Uh, yeah, and so it, it depends on the person and the kid. So this is this is somebody's somebody might have this. It might make sense for them if they like cooking. Then cooking, mixing, chopping, 
things like that, age appropriate, right, for any of these sorts of things, and helping them set the table, using two hands to carry and balance things, um, giving them lots of different kinds of crunchy and chewy foods. Um, and then at night, perhaps after dinner, maybe they're doing craft projects that are calming to them and or um, something that's going to get them in the mood, especially at nighttime, uh, to get to sleep. Uh, warm baths with bubbles and calming essential oils might be something. A massage during reading time. And there was uh, a family that discovered that in doing this particular activity, that giving a massage to their child in the bubble bath they didn't know this when they did it, right? So when I, I say that, they gave him a massage and he calmed down and then he pooped in the tub. Well, guess what they learned how to do? They learned how to give him a massage and have him on the toilet so that then he would he would poop in the toilet. So, right, timing timing's everything. But they did learn that that was something that calmed him and that also then helped him go to sleep. Um, so I, I think that, Everything you do for a person, it needs to be functional, it needs to be age appropriate, and when we're set, setting up little activities, they should be brief. They should, you know, they should they should be things that maybe two minutes is is a lot of time. Um, at one school that I went to, and it was at, it was at a high school, public high school. And the students that would do their sensory diet, their way, they had a parapro who manned a particular classroom. And so students then from throughout the building would come up uh, in between class. So that's how quick that these things that they that they might come in and they might engage in some in some weightlifting kinds of things or um, on the treadmill and run really fast for a minute or uh, engage in something else. Um, and I think they need to be individualized. Um, but I think that you, you know, finding things that your your child may may need and benefit from, Googling, using the internet to find different activities. If it's very complicated, please, please, please work with an occupational therapist. Occupational therapists at this point have to have their master's degrees. They have to have gone to extensive uh, you know, clinicals and things like that. And remember, the, and the goal of this is that we want all students to be part of their school and school and home community. Um, so thank you very much. And I hope that this is something that is that is considered by all of you when looking at individuals with some kind of challenging behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Sally, for sharing this important information with us. Remember, you can follow Michigan Alliance for Families on social media and check out our video library on YouTube. You can reach out directly to your regional parent mentor as you have questions or need support. Follow-up questions can be directed to info at michiganallianceforfamilies.org or 1-800-552-4821. Michigan Alliance for Families is an IDEA grant-funded initiative of the Michigan Department of Education, Office of Special Education, and Michigan's Federal Parent Training and Information Center, funded by the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs. Thank you for learning with us today.